laptop thinks it's projecting. He said your laptop thinks it's projecting. Yeah, that was so unusual. Yeah, not a guy. Yep, so, two, three, three. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We'll call the City Council work session to order. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilperson Lamore. Present. Felder. Here. Whitman. Excused. Gilray. Here. Here. Germani. She's excused. Mayor Clark. Present. So we have a few items on the agenda for our work session today. First, I'll say welcome to everybody. It's great to see all the uh, students and families here this evening. I know we have some special presentations, a couple of them. So, Mr. Pastu, if you want to get started. Thank <laughs> you. 
That's right, them Arbor Wood Eagles, right? Come on, you gotta say, yeah. Yeah. All right. All right, Mark, I'm sorry. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, Mark Cochran, Economic and Community Development Director. Uh, a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, I guess it was, I had the distinct pleasure and honor to visit with the second grade uh, students at Arborwood North and South Elementary um, to have a discussion about a project that they've been working on all year. And I don't want to get into uh, the content, but I think it's uh, very relevant and they've got uh, some good research to present as well as some recommendations. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Ms. T um, from Arborwood to talk about what the project is and introduce the students. I'm not going to do much of the presentation as we're going to leave it completely up to our second graders behind us. But I am just going to start real quick that this is what we call a project-based learning activity where we took our trimester three curriculum from second grade, our huge undertaking for social studies is our community. So we got really, really in depth and really involved with what we see in our community, what we want in our community. And we just kind of started taking steps. Um, this is Mathis and I. It was a little difficult as teachers to kind of take that step back. But um, the big goal was to give all the ownership over to the students. So I am actually going to take a step back. I'm gonna call up all of our second graders and they have some presentations to show you. So George, Taylor, we have uh, Jackson, Evan, Erica. That's all of my friends. All right, everybody come on up. So first we have Mark, microphone. Yeah. He's gonna just remember what you know. So first we have Mr. George Ferris. So George, I'm gonna have you come this way. I'm gonna put your. I'm gonna hold your. Hold your. Do you want me to hold it? Would you like a microphone, or do you want to use your outside reset voice? <laughs> That way everybody who's watching at home can hear you too. Okay, so start with our first step. What did we do first? What was the first thing that we did? What kind of trip did we take? We went to a bus. A bus tour. What did we see on our bus tour? Places in Morocco. <laughs> to talk to everybody, you can look at the camera up here and see at home. Did you have fun? Yes. Okay, that's, what I, that's the main thing. So I'm going to guess you went, did you go to the park? Yeah. Which park did you go to? So which, what is this picture show? Would we have, do we have people come in and take over interviews? Good job. 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 Good job.
fun.
for families to go to and have more fun. And we did this project to to make more fun things to come to the world. And <laughs> what we have done, I made a list of stuff of my nurse stuff. We figured out who we needed to talk to. We took a bus tour. We did a lot of research, and we noticed and we did more fun stuff for to have more fun and more fun places. Um, part three. I think we're going to the Tripoli Park because families will like it, and it will be fun, and people will have fun. Not even families, but. But um, adults might might like it too, and it will be fun. And the will will have um, more money <laughs> to get a trip. I think we need to talk to Art Hopper because he he works at the city of Reno and he can make things come to you. There you go. second graders, we had the uh, privilege of speaking to Mr. Mark Cochran, to um, Mr. Tim Lake, to Mr. Daryl Diamond, and Mrs. Karen Sweat were all um, interviewed because we decided they were the people who can help us out. They are what they, the kids call the builders and the bringer-inners. Yes. <laughs> the builders and the bringer-inners, yep. and Mr. Diamond just runs the fair. They saw it. Who else is going to run stuff besides a whole fair? Um, so they, we are doing um, another presentation for our school and our families on Wednesday from 1 to 2 in the Arborwood South um, gym. But we have decided we want trampoline parks and Dollar Trees and laser tag and water parks and splash pads. Those are the big ones. Yep. Um, the, actually, and those were the big ones determined on our data of 343 people that took our Google survey. All right, anything else you'd like to add? Jackson? George? David? Lost David. Brett? Great. Well, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, okay, very good. We thank you. Web -based, so we had to oh, oh, wonderful. Well, I want to thank you all for being here this evening in Arborwood. The Arborwood goals to come and rep uh, represent your school and yourselves and your families here at City Hall at our work session. Uh, you know, I think one of the items that you talked about on the uh, in the parks and the splash pads, we put our first splash pad in uh, last year, and we're working on the second one this year and should be in operation for next year by the time we get it done. So the one splash pad is at Labor Park, and the second one will go in at Father Carnes Park. So now that's your research to go and look at the city parks and see where it's at, and you can go find uh, get go there with your families and have fun. And it's in the splash in the water and the splash pad this summer. That's wonderful. I want to thank you for being here and the ideas. Uh, Councilwoman? One more. Oh, thank you. See, Councilwoman Viney knows that, and uh, come... Memorial weekend, the splash pad at Labor Park will be turned on. So it'll be fun time since if it stays like as warm as it's been getting, it, it, we need that. Yes, you want a picture? Yeah, they might be a picture. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It just might be in the newspaper. <laughs> yeah, come on, stand up in front here and look that way. We can stand, we can stand up. Hey, come on, stand up here. Come on. And you can slide get close to the middle here. Yeah, right here. And then what they're going to do is they're going to look this way and take a picture. Over there, so you can be in the picture, okay? Okay. Yeah, we're good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
To the right person, Mr. Cochran, the Economic and Community Development uh, Director, so they got to the right door for that. <laughs> Bye. and sending already so I don't know who's got to follow that act but I tell you what <laughs> um, uh, Mark are you going to introduce for the next item thank you <laughs> it's an appropriate lead up after that uh, presentation about how we can bring more family friendly places and events to Monroe um, Stephanie Kasperzak with MCOP uh, and the Opportunity Center wanted to provide an update to City Council on the a uh, vast array of programs and activities that they have planned um, over the, the next year. So, Stephanie. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. Honorable Welcome. Mayor and City Council. Thank you guys for having me this, mor or this morning, this evening. Um, I just wanted to make sure that um, everybody saw all the wonderful activities that we have going on at the Opportunity Center. Um, as you guys well, are well aware, um, last fall we extended our contract uh, to operate the Opportunity Center, and it's been a while since I came to present. And um, one of the great things that we're doing this upcoming summer is to operate Summer Tot Lot. And so we wanted to give just a little update um, as uh, how, how that's playing out and how that's going to be rolling out in the city but also we have a couple of other great things that we wanted to let you know as well so you have a few items there in front of you um, that I provided that include um, our first big event of the summer is our Juneteenth celebration which is going to be Saturday June 18th. Um, it's going to be really everywhere, but the Opportunity Center, Labor Park, um, and all around the area where we're going to um, celebrate Juneteenth, we're going to unveil the community garden and our community mural, which is being done by local artist Amy Arnold. And um, she's going to do a paint by number mural. Um, right outside of the garden. And so the entire community will get to uh, have paintbrushes and aprons and be able to um, help us with creating art at the Opportunity Center. So mark your calendars for that date. That is a draft flyer. So um, please excuse it. It might not be the final yet, um, but we wanted to make sure that you at least save the date and got the, the date on your calendar. Um, the next piece is our summer camp. 
Um, for 2022, we have, I think, eight weeks of summer camp starting when school ends. Um, our first day is going to be Monday, June 13th. Um, we're going to have uh, LaTanya Garth, who's going to be coming in. Um, you guys are very familiar with LaTanya. She's been doing a lot of our mentoring and programming at the Opportunity Center. And she's going to be doing Kidpreneurs, where we're going to bring in young entrepreneurs who are all children, and they're going to teach the kids how to start their own business. So it's going to be a super program. And then we have Dancing with the Stars, an art week, again, with Amy Arnold, um, a garden activity, Discover Monroe, Sports Week, Young Authors Club, and Glee Week. So lots of great activities for summer camp. And then the following week, starting June 20th, we have our Tot Lot. Um, tot Lot is going to be at six locations, and they're all listed on that flyer. Mm -hmm. Um, we have two staff, two coordinators who are running and getting summer camp and tot lot organized who started May 1st. Um, but we're going to be running tot lot with our summer, through our summer youth employment program. So the first year, you guys might recall, we had nine summer youth workers. Last year, we had 11. This year, we're hiring 20. We have more than 20 applications, and we have all of our tot lot kids already hired. So we know that tot lot's going to be taken care of with our summer youth employees, which is a great program. It starts with kids 14 to 18, and um, kids will be not only at tot lot, but at the food pantry, um, in, in uh, the community garden, and just everywhere at the Opportunity Center and Labor Park. So really, really great for young people to get involved in, in these activities. Um, so that is Tot Lot. You can see where we're going to be. We added a new location this year at Greenwood. Um, so we're working with Nancy Wayne at the Mineral Housing Commission. We thought that was a, um, a good opportunity for us to expand the Tot Lot. But if anybody has questions about what we're doing, um, you can let me know. But one of the great things that happened in the last couple of weeks is Sodexo reached out through Mineral Public Schools. They're going to be providing all of our meals. They're going to bring the meals to each of these sites. They're going to serve them. Um, and they're going to be right there on site, which saved a little money in our budget, but also um, it took... It, it, it allowed us to have a little more staffing flexibility um, because we were beginning to wonder how we were going to get to all these sites and, and make it all work because we're providing transportation, not only for our summer youth, um, but some of the kids in the community as well. So we're going to be working with Sodexo, and thanks to Monroe Public Schools for pulling that together for us. Um, and then I, I know that Woody Hoffer, who's not part of our advisory council, has been in front of you. Um, between June 18th and July 16th, the mural projects are going to be going on all across the city of Monroe, um, including our one at the Opportunity Center. And um, Planting Seeds, which is um, the, the name of, of the initiative that Woody has been working on now for two years, um, really revolves around cultivating empowerment for the arts, culture, and community. And we're going to be um, celebrating all of the murals uh, at a block party on June, uh, July, July 16th. Um, so you can mark your calendars for that too. Also at the Opportunity Center and in Labor Park. Um, so along with that, I wanted to make mention, in case you missed our annual meeting this year, um, we did receive $375,000 in a grant for the Opportunity Center. And that's going to provide two different um, key pieces of programming as we move through the summer. Um, it is through the <coughs> Community Health Community Mental Health, I'm mean, still working on this acronym, Community Mental Health Partnership with Southeastern Michigan. And um, 350000 is to do prevention and treatment activities for substance abuse um, for youth ages 12 to 17 in our community. Um, the second piece is, um, as you know, we've been working with Family Medical Center on the Community Health Hub, and we have a behavioral health kiosk in the health hub. And so the other grant is to reach out to African American and Hispanic communities to make sure that we are um, inviting people to access the kiosk and mental health services at the Opportunity Center through the Health Hub. So we're super excited about the new grant um, and all of these things, actually. As you guys know, as, we, as we've been there now for two and a half years, um, it's really been exciting to see all the transformation that's taken place at the Opportunity Center. And now that we're back pretty much fully functioning um, after the pandemic, um, we have summer camp, we have summer tot lot, we have all these great events coming up, and we hope you come out and join us. So I wanted to make sure you got that paper in front of you, and then I'll answer any questions that you guys have.
Sure. Thanks, Stephanie. I'll see if there's mm -hmm. any questions from council. This, I, I want to all start with saying thanks for the, the flyers. It's always nice to get the items on the calendar. I know that you share those already with the uh, administration, but uh, to get it out to the community as well. So this would be wonderful to uh, participate in dates that are uh, that we can. Uh, Brian. Yeah, no questions, but uh, thank you for the update. And uh, of course. really, we, we appreciate everything that you guys are doing with the uh, Opportunity Center. It's, it's fantastic. So thank you. We're having a new, slogo coming, uh, new slogan coming out uh, soon. And um, there's always something going on at the center. And, you know, we thought of that because there's always something going on at the center. So we hope to continue with that momentum. And if you guys have any questions, you know how to reach me. Just, you know, call me and let me know, and we'll be happy to answer. But hopefully we see you guys out at all these great activities in the summer. Sounds great. Thank yeah. you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Pastu. Thank you, Your Honor. I got my mic on here. Um, you know, earlier this year, uh, we had discussed uh, some uh, amendments uh, to the ordinance uh, as it pertains to uh, mobile retail ordinances, uh, essentially food truck, uh, hawkers, peddler uh, ordinances. And um, a city attorney, uh, Mr. Buds, uh, Clerk Treasurer Lavoie, and myself have had a couple of discussions. And, and, and even after meeting with council, struggling with uh, how exactly are we going to, to put this uh, together and, and probably in some ways just really uh, um, make it simple and understandable for ourselves uh, uh, since uh, there's a, a regulatory aspect. But the intent was always to streamline the application for the food trucks and make it uh, more encouraging for special events. And, and so, uh, you know, what we did, we thought uh, after we had a good discussion last week uh, trying to start the ordinance uh, development, uh, you know, we uh, set out a $250 annual fee, encompasses any type of use uh, with that. Uh, you know, I can have Michelle in a moment just tell you a little bit uh, what details will be needed and necessary. But the purpose uh, for the uh, uh, application is just, just to verify <laughs> that the state and public health department uh, licenses are in place before they operate and function uh, here in, within the city. Verify for a special event, particularly if it's located on city property, that the vendor has a certificate of insurance naming uh, the city as an additional insured, whether it's the vendor and or the event organizer, that's, but just to make sure that our, uh, we're protected in that regard. Uh, certainly to, for the uh, vendor to provide proof of tax identification, which would come with the, uh, the permit application. And more importantly, I guess, acknowledge the awareness of what our regulations are. Well, they may not be onerous. We still want them to, to know you still got to report to, uh, if you're uh, going to, to be a part of uh, an event. Uh, so we listed the locations uh, so that we know that if they're on private property, they're fine with that uh, as long as uh, they're not creating a uh, vehicle or pedestrian obstruction. Um, for special events that are usually going to take place on city property, uh, in a park, or on the city street, uh, uh, the event organizer is going to be responsible to list all of the food truck vendors uh, so the clerk can verify, again, all of the things that were uh, previously mentioned uh, and have been approved for the entire season. Uh, and again, the help with the insurance verification, uh, but also for the event organizer to identify the locations where the um, food trucks are going to be uh, stationed. Um, in prior discussions, most recently, we've, you know, we're uh, access to uh, power to provide uh, the necessary power for these food trucks and or other elements of a special event it is a consideration, particularly in the downtown. So, uh, Again, there's insight that can be offered uh, through public safety that uh, as to where would be a suitable uh, place for their location uh, so that there is minimal uh, uh, problems associated with uh, vehicle or pedestrian movement as well as emergency vehicle access. And then lastly, we put up the pop-up locations and again, the vendor to notify the clerk treasurer uh, before setting up. Uh, most importantly, date, time, and location are important. Uh, although um, I didn't put this on there uh, it, uh, in the report, uh, but it, uh, they need to pull a per, uh, special event permit just to tell us where, when, and, and, and again, part of it is we don't want them obstructing uh, uh, 
key parking spaces in the downtown uh, and or locations that may create uh, other problems. We want them to be successful, but don't want any other uh, uh, problems associated with uh, a pop-up location. So we put that out there just to make sure everybody would be on board with it. I think it would provide us the direction uh, if uh, council is fine with it uh, to, to proceed with drafting the ordinance. Uh, um, and lastly, uh, it was discussed a couple months ago about sending notices to, to downtown businesses uh, through the DDA, which was done, and we didn't get any feedback related to any comments uh, that were there. So we may send another note that, look, this, if, if council's ready to move forward with it, this will be the first reading of the ordinance. So wanted to get back with council just to make sure you were comfortable with uh, what's being proposed. Clerk Lavoie, and I know that you uh, obviously were part of the discussions and input, so any maybe reviews. And uh, I want to make sure I understand on the permit application fee, though. Um, so, so currently, for an entire season, it's two hundred and fifty dollars, uh, and for a special event, it's fifty dollars. And we're proposing that it just be a flat fifty for everyone, um, and then. Because right now they're partitioned off. The special events are partitioned off from the, from the, there's one set, not one set of rules, but there is one set of fees for special events. And then there's one set of fees for somebody who wants to come in and get a permit so that they can be flexible and bend all season in the area. Um, I think the thought process, and I say think because I don't want to assume that I'm, I don't want to assume that I'm speaking for, for city manager past due, but you know, one of the things we did talk about was in terms of economic development, creating synergy, that sort of thing. There's a real um, energy around food trucks and et cetera right now, and even pop-up vendors. So um, this will, this will kind of help you know, show that we're welcoming, yet we still have rules and regulations that when they're here in the city, they can't just go set up wherever they want. Um, you know, they, they need to be communicating with us, and likewise, we need to be communicating with them. And we like, and as City Manager Pastu said, we'll make sure they have all of their, everything that they're supposed to have, the health department, et cetera. It'll give me the opportunity to work with um, Director Tolstead, and, and we've, worked, we've come up with, I think, a really well-run um, relationship in terms of the food trucks. It's always worked very well. Um, it's the same with ice cream and um, Hawker Peddler. We keep each other informed, and, it, and it's worked really well. So um, I would encourage the um, council to, to to agree to move forward with this. I think it'll be beneficial. Um, and they're coming. The food trucks are coming, and more and more of them are coming. And we have some very energetic businesses downtown now who are going to bring them in. So um, I think I think this will be a, a good way to be working together and yet still be able to, like I said, to keep up with our rules and regulations that that for a city we need to maintain. So as I read through this, one of the items I know that's uh, an adjustment, and I think it really shifts where those responsibilities are and, and to really get it moving, uh, I'll say for the special events, uh, the event organizer who's pulling the activity and then submitting the application for event, and they all have the responsibility for all the food truck vendors to make sure things are in place and have those. So it's not coming back to the clerk's office or the administration to have to sit there and continue to have dialogue with the food trucks. It's the event coordinator, the event uh, organizer to do all those things. And they need to verify that they, uh, obviously they'll, we have the records if they're paid their annual, but then to make sure they have the necessary insurance and all those coverage. We'll get that from the event coordinator. Right. So it mirrors the hawker peddler transient merchant when there are, um, when there's a large event like the the downtown, um, I don't want to say the wrong name. I want to say flea market, but that's not quite right. right. But the downtown event, um, you know, they they're supposed to or the old art um, yeah. event we used to have, they come, they bring the list of vendors to me with their tax ID numbers and we keep that on file. And again, the, the police then are aware of who's going to be there. And I really think for, it'll make for more seamless planning for our special events. Um, I wouldn't say we're, we've been in the way, but I do know it's made the whole process more cumbersome as, uh, different organizers try to get food trucks to come to the area. It's, it's, Whereas this way, as long as you're licensed in the city, I have all of your information. Um, I'll be, I'll have a list, and the organizers can see if they want to bring someone new. They certainly can, but then they need to direct them to our website to make sure they get their permit. I just think it'll all improve relations relationships 
not that they're bad, but I think you can always you can always keep moving forward, and it'll help it'll help the organizers as they move forward because they have to get started really early, and um, and they can just they can just start working on it. And like it says at the beginning, our vision to streamline the application process process and it's easier and more convenient going to be more they'd be willing and they're dealing with one location when they're coming through mm -hmm. so i'll see if there's other questions but mr bass too before that is, is this something you're looking to bring forward back to council then on a item soon yes uh your honor uh, we would uh you know certainly working uh you know with uh, mr buds uh, in the preparation and drafting of the ordinance so that this is kind of laid out in a form that's uh you know Clear, uh, but as well as corresponding with the permit application that would go along with it as well. So, but and, yeah, we plan either maybe the next meeting or uh, on the June sixth, and I think the sooner the better is probably mm -hmm. the. Uh, yeah. I was I was sorry I jumped in You're there, fine. but um, yeah, we do need to move this along. We have you know we have one vendor who's already bought into the the annual permit, and they're they've been here. Th I think this is their third year they're vending here in the city. Um, so. It, and we've got a couple of events that are coming up, and we have um, some vendors who are already in the cycle that I'm approving right now. So, yeah, the sooner that we can do this, the, the better. Wonderful. I'll see if there's any questions from council for administration or on the food trucks. Right. We really went back and forth on this, um, <laughs> Matt Buds and, and Mr. Pastu and I. We had several meetings, and we were sure, and then we came, we, we went away and each thought about it and came back. And, and like I said, once we started kind of looking at Hawker Peddler, it really kind of made sense. And that's the other good thing. It kind of, you know, brings all of them closer. They're not the same permit, and they don't have all the same regulations because they can't. But it does, there are definitely some similarities, which will make it better for administration purposes, as you mentioned before. Good. Excellent. So see nothing further, uh, Mr. Bastu? Well, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, next item. <coughs> next item is uh, proposed CDBG annual action plan. Uh, Caitlin, uh, Mark, uh, you want to? Uh, as you know, on the agenda tonight, uh, regular meeting agenda and the consent agenda, we just have a uh, meeting to our uh, uh, an item to schedule a public hearing for our uh, June sixth meeting. Um, internally, we've. Uh, looked at uh, an allocation. Finally, I think today we got from HUD how much our allocation will be for fiscal year 22-23. Uh, but uh, Mr. Cochran, uh, myself, uh, Ms. Pierce, and, and Mr. Sell, we looked, uh, looked at it last week and, and came up with uh, an outline of a, a, an action plan for the following year. Wanted to present it to council prior to scheduling the public hearing and talk a little bit about the rationale behind it. So, Caitlin? Good evening, Mayor Council. Caitlin McBriarty, um, Economic and Community De Development Department. So it's the time of year for the CDBG Annual Action Plan. The Community Development Black Grant Program is run through HUD, and it is allocated um, funds every year, at which 70% at a minimum go to benefit low and moderate income residents of the city. This year, our award for the 22-23 program year is $453,322. We, we have an estimated carryover from last year of $589,324.61 for a total of an estimated $1,042,646.61 to be allocated for this year's program. This is the proposed sub submission. We're gonna focus on blight removal and code enforcement, down payment assistance in the neighborhood enterprise zones, assistance for at risk and homeless, housing rehabilitation, the Elm House, a big push for public facilities improvement in planning and administration. And just broken down a little bit more of what is included in those categories. Blight removal and code enforcement, $155,753.61. And that'll include demolition of vacant and dangerous structures. The down payment assistance, $10,000. And that is for residents buying homes in the neighborhood enterprise zones. Emergency food distribution, $7,500. And this is a mobile food pantry so they go into the neighborhoods and, and distribute boxes of food. 
We'll continue the FIXED program, which is a home rehabilitation program for qualified residents. Foreclosure and homelessness prevention is a legal service, and it helps residents who are facing foreclosure and also domestic violence cases, people at risk of becoming homeless. It helps them stay in their home, and if they can, they do put them in programs that help to find them affordable housing. Lead-based paint remediation. Elm House is a group home for developmentally disabled adults. Um, they are proposing a, a new roof for their facility. They have 12 residents there and just some much needed help there. An air conditioning at the Arthur Ludlow Community Center. Dorsch Library basement waterproofing. Renovations to Carnes Park improvements to the MLK bridge, and planning and administration costs to run the program. That is the proposed budget for the upcoming year. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. I don't have any questions, but I have a couple of comments. <clears throat> I'm glad to see the fixed program up a bit this year. Um, the down payment assistance and the foreclosure and homeless prevention, are those going to individual agencies or will those be administered uh, from the city? Be, uh, the reason why I ask is because I think it's such a minuscule amount and um, I would like to consider increasing those amounts, especially considering um, the housing crisis that we find ourselves in. Um, I know um, the state of Michigan has the first time home buyer program. Um, MCOP administers that for our county. And um, I don't know how much is in that budget or whatnot, but it used to be like 7,500 per individual. Okay. I think it might've went up to 10,000. So are we proposing to only help one person um, through this budget? The if I may, just uh, I don't think there's been in, in the recent years much activity in there. We do budget something, uh, and that's in fact uh, the case with a couple of the, the line items there. Similarly, lead-based paint remediation, uh, uh, and I think we're required to put something for home assistance uh, through our HUD guidelines, and so yes. we, we put a dollar amount there um, with that, and, and certainly uh, you know, when we put this together, I think part of it was, was uh, and it, Caitlin can pull back up the previous screen is that we've got some flexibility between moving uh, within these line items themselves. And so uh, I think that, uh, you know, we've got a lot of it in public facilities, but we can move as much as what, 100,000 without going through another public. Uh, so from a public facility standpoint, if you wanted to move another 50,000 into uh, home you know, assistance or down payment assistance, there's that, that capacity. And frankly, that in some ways that's our contingency, if you will. Um, whatever we don't uh, use, I think we could, uh, um, you know, put into some other programming if we find suddenly there's a need for that uh, in, in that capacity. Uh, Mark? Oh. If I may add, as we were developing this with uh, down payment assistance, traditionally the city hasn't had a process to apply for these funds either, or a structure or a program that would encourage folks to apply, and that's why there's been little activity involved in it as well. Um, but with the reorganization of the department that I know we're gonna talk about tonight, with the neighborhood services division or, or department, um, the coordinator position, helping us set up the uh, down payment assistance program, both the process as well as um, how we can use those funds possibly for like the residential infill development and the path to home ownership program to offer these as a, a supplement to that sort of program. So uh, looking at that over the, uh, the course of the next year, $10,000 in there this year, but looking to increase that uh, possibly in the future as we begin to stand up that program. Yeah, just a thought on that. And also, you know, it's wonderful to see the... Uh, can you go back? The, ne the next slide, right? Yeah. All the facilities that we'll be able to help, I, I'm, I've said it every year, I'm gonna say it again. Uh, the, AL, the Opportunity Center at ALCC and Navarre Library, 
is is all owned by the city. Um, we have um, roof damage. I've I've been in contact with the building department, sending pictures, and um, we have crack tiles in the entry. That is a, a polling place. Um, I know that we possibly may have plans for the future to build a new library facility, but I think if we're going to keep putting money into the other side of the building, which is all one parcel to my understanding, and it's all owned by the city, we um, should not continue neglecting the other side because that building, the other side of the building is going um, quickly into disrepair. Um, I've sent emails to different uh, department heads to keep them posted about um, the tiles falling, the ceiling budget, um, buckling, and other items in the building. So I would, um, you know, I don't know if the library um, had the right to present like the different agencies do um, <laughs> to ask you for this funding to go for their building or their needs. And if maybe Navarre, um, if Nancy is not letting you know, but I just wanted to say that again, that um, once again, the VAR library is not included and it's continually uh, going into disrepair. And I'm excited that possibly maybe in the future we may have a new library, but um, you know, we do serve a large population. And um, so we need to think about keeping that building uh, repaired as well. So when we submit to HUD the CDBG plan, we only include the, the line public facilities. It doesn't get broken down like this. Mm -hmm. This is just the plan for at least the next year. And the air conditioning was in the CIP, but also when we had the staff discussions about allocating the funds to the different public facilities, we said we're hopeful that we'll be able to secure some funds to build a new library building and renovate the ALC, the Opportunity Center um, as was intended in the space analysis. And if that happens, then we would fold these costs into that project and reallocate these costs. So it's sort of just a plan and a placeholder for now, and we can continue to look at how those the public facilities item uh, gets spent into the future. Yeah, I just wanted to put that out there once again, because since I've been on council, I, I haven't calculated, but it's, it's up in the millions that we put just into one side of the building. And um, well, I know with the um, HVAC system that services both of the buildings, so we have to, you know, that was one improvement that included us, but uh, Navarre Library. But um, so I just wanted to put that out there again when you guys are having your conversations to think about Navarre as being a part of that whole complex there. Thank you. Was from council. Uh, Andrew. Regarding the discussion that I know that we've had as council regarding the um, library and opportunity center expansion, um, would those be CDBG eligible projects? And then I know that we've had the discussion regarding a supportive housing facility as well. Now I know that those are both higher ticket items, but could a portion of these funds in the future in the same way that we're uh, dedicating funds to Carnes Park now be dedicated to those projects? We have a couple of sources. We still have a Section 108 uh, loan program that we got a couple million bucks uh, that theoretically could be used for housing-related uh, costs. Uh, again, it does commit your future CDBG uh, programming money uh, unless you've got a revenue stream to uh, uh, repay that. Um, but also, yeah, you can uh, do that uh, with... Uh, with the CDBG to you know whatever extent that, that we have funds available, so uh, for th that type of programming. In the case of the design for the um, Navarre Library Opportunity Center, I you literally given the cost of it, uh, it would be the scope, uh, the funding just wouldn't be practical uh, for that. Uh, so, uh, but you know, theoretically, yeah, you could put it into the library as well as uh, the Opportunity Center on an ongoing basis. So just given the budget that we have available to us this year because of the carryover from last year, it seems like we have certain opportunities available to us mm -hmm. now that we might not otherwise have available to us. And yeah. this is 
in, in you know because of that an abnormal amount of funding to see in this budget. Yeah. And I think one thing that uh, you know again uh, just toggling between the the last one uh, slide and this one with uh, public facilities, we've used that as kind of uh, if you will where the flexibility exists. We put some money into Carnes Park. I think we had uh, 1.7 something earmarked for Carnes. We know it's going to be in excess of $2 million. We also know it's going to be required to follow federal uh, procurement requirements. And so, you know, our thought is to the, to the extent we can put uh, uh, as much uh, funding toward projects that we know are going to require uh, uh, federal uh, uh, procurement, re you know, uh, compliance that, uh, the uh, the other more flexible city funds uh, we'll put to other projects that will fit within our existing uh, purchase uh, uh, ordinance. So that's kind of in, in some ways why you know we have uh, such a large number with public facilities. And then we're just waiting to see if there's anything. You know, we put a couple of requests in for consideration related to state or federal appropriations for the project uh, there at the Opportunity Center and. Uh, um, in library so if that comes in you can sweep it into another project so it's it's really the mindset uh, for putting this together okay thank you sir. other questions and just i'll just follow up uh, with uh, uh, kelly's comments i think that and i think it's been said that you know having it in the p uh, public facilities it's kind of there and available if there is a, up to a certain amount of a transition It'd be interesting to see how the down payment assistance um, a rollout goes and what kind of response we get there i agree if there's if we have those that are interested that uh, that is a item that i think would be beneficial because it's moving people uh, into uh, that the homes and, and protecting that and of course, the other side of that is the homeless uh, prevention, and if if that somehow uh, gets associated to it, so I think the flexibility is there to at least address some of it. It's more than what's currently stated in the line item, but there's line item that provides some of that uh, backup if needed. So we'll watch that as it goes forward. I think. There's no other questions for Caitlin or Mark. I guess we're done. Thank, Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Uh, Vince. Um, Next item is just, uh, I've had uh, some discussion with uh, County Administrator uh, uh, Mike Basonic. Uh, uh, in our uh, ARPA money for related to the uh, uh, Port of Monroe, uh, we had uh, earmarked uh, roughly 1.6 million. Uh, we're looking at uh, 1.7. The county uh, will be presenting that amount for approval uh, at their June uh, 7th meeting. And so I provided backup information that uh, uh, the port provided the county talking about uh, the uh, container project and how this funding would fit into um, the objective of uh, expanding the activity there, the efficiency of it, but also the economic impact that would be related to the, uh, uh, the container uh, terminal that uh, would help uh, more product come into the uh, uh, port. So. I'm not sure if there's any questions that you have with it, other than I thought it was important since we had talked about 1.6 million in the CIP, uh, we're now proposing 1.7, and that would equal what the county is going to be considering at their uh, June uh, 7th meeting the following night. Questions for Mr. The one part in here, of course, is, you know, as we know, we had conversations with the port, uh, the U.S. Customs and Border Patrol protection and uh, the importance of that role. These, these uh, I'll say, upgrades along with that equipment will be necessary uh, for um, the, the port to see the, the greatest possibility of commerce and revenues as they move forward. Yes, uh, um, Councilwoman. Uh, Kelly? I know in the past the port was, um, I don't know, maybe this was a vision far out, interested in uh, um, maybe commodities and things like that. Have we moved any closer to that, um, Brian, or anybody who would know? I'm sorry, what was the, what's the question again? I'm sorry. I know the port had a vision in the future for uh, moving commodities and things through the port. Um, 
Have, have like, they like moved any like, closer to that? To more like bulk car cargo and stuff. Or, yeah, or like Mark has probably has some information for us. Yeah, it does do we we currently do move commodities through in and out of the port. Also, there are, uh, are commodities that uh, are created down at the port uh, that get exported out as well. Flyers. So there's, there's and yeah. things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I was thinking more of like retail type uh, things. Or is it going to stay like industrial type? Yeah. Um, that, okay. You get what I'm asking you? <laughs> I do. I, I think. think. Yeah, so yeah. fill me in. Um, so as the port has sought to diversify their, the shipments that are coming in and out of the port, they're really looking at international cargo coming in and out of the port. I think one of the projects that's been most talked about is uh, automobile parts and auto finished automobiles. I don't know if we can say what the automobiles were. Um, working with one of the big three out of Detroit and shipping their finished cars to Europe and then bringing cargo back from Europe uh, coming back and forth. But um, unfortunately, they've been blocked from doing that by CBP because of the difference in created cargo and break, uh, bulk break cargo. Um, and so with this, with the request that uh, we're talking about tonight, they'll be able to uh, have CBP service set up at the port through an x-ray scanning equipment to allow for that diversification of product. I know they've been having more domestic product coming in and out of the port of various um, various uh, sources, but um, talking more about international, that's the, the purpose of this. Did that answer your question? Okay. I know they're doing a great job down there. Other ports talk about our port and how great it is. So I hadn't met with him in a while, but we talked about that. I was wondering, did he ever get any closer to that? Um, uh, Mr. Pastu? The uh, next item on the uh, work session is a discussion related with the uh, economic uh, and community development reorganization, and in particular as it pertains to discussions that we had uh, uh, with the goals and objectives for developing a uh, uh, housing strategy. And I'm at a point now where in the process of preparing uh, job descriptions uh, for the positions, and the one that I'm working on uh, is the neighborhood services position, probably treating it as a deputy director to, in order to bring in someone with uh, high level of experience, uh, but I think the significant part of it is is understanding, you know, and I just cut and pasted something uh, I pulled up on the website, on the web uh, related to, you know, what is a local housing strategy. And in particular in Monroe, we've got a, a significant variety of housing types and neighborhoods, each of them having their own different uh, characteristics, uh, needs, challenges, issues to preserve, uh, whether it's in the historic district, uh, uh, you know, sometimes concentrations of rental housing. And so as you read through this, there's various tools associated with it. But I think, uh, you know, first and foremost, what there is is, a, is an in-depth analysis of the conditions uh, uh, related to that. Uh, uh, what, what are the needs and the problems uh, uh, with that? Uh, you know, defining the objectives uh, that you want to achieve, and there's some listing uh, down there, uh, but also looking at a comprehensive approach with it, uh, funding sources and contingencies, much like the question uh, uh, Councilman Felder asked about the use of CDBG money. I mentioned Section 108. Uh, there's other incentives that may be out there and available um, to uh, the Neighborhood Enterprise Zone being one that, that would all go part of that uh, uh, strategy with it, but at its core is doing an assessment, uh, determining what's uh, what the needs are and what the alternatives are, and then uh, council has to make certain policy uh, determinations based on that in, in formulating the strategy, uh, as well as developing the plan for its implementation once once that's uh, uh, been achieved. And so they all kind of have to go hand in hand. I present this uh, to council uh, as I'm finishing up some job descriptions. I would like to uh, concurrently have uh, the uh, neighborhood uh, 
specialist position and an RFP, RFQ for uh, the uh, housing uh, strategy uh, out at the same time so that uh, when in, we do have uh, someone coming in, we'll be able at that point to start initiating uh, uh, the dialogue with uh, uh, a broader housing strategy. So uh, point of this is, uh, if you're okay with that, I'll move forward. If you need more time to discuss it, you know, let me know. Thanks, Vince. Questions for uh, the manager? I know the, the handout you have here, I'm sure we'll, I'll, I'll be looking at it again. I was kind of glancing at it as you were chatting, but uh, we'll go through and have some maybe some thoughts afterwards. I'll wait for a second, see if there's any questions. Well, let me go then. I'll talk further. I uh, oh, go ahead. just uh, didn't want to dominate the entire <coughs> conversation, but uh, going back to the different types of housing that we have, I mean, you do have a, uh, you know, uh, homes, uh, historic homes that uh, preservation is an issue. Uh, we can talk about, and it kind of alludes to in the outline I handed out to you, but, uh, but there's also neighborhood strategies. I mean, we've had the discussion about in the past of uh, the amount of on-street parking associated with homes in which there are multiple rental units in a single family home. And the problem that that creates uh, from a, uh, a traffic uh, standpoint, uh, snow plowing, that type of thing, as well as the impact on the, uh, uh, on the adjoining neighbors. There's policies and procedures you can use that. Uh, I can tell you from our refuse uh, uh, process that uh, in many ways the taxpayers in this community subsidize uh, the multiple family uh, uh, housing units in there as a strategy. Do you want them to pay their fair share? Uh, again, another policy consideration. But all of these are basically piling uh, uh, towards some decisions and, and policy issues that the council will have to take in developing this. Uh, I consider, for example, what do you want to do with the alleyways? In, in certain neighborhoods, it may make sense to restore them to their designed uh, use, uh, which were very practical before uh, you know, suburban growth uh, influenced uh, urban design. So you know, I, they're they're very functional, and I think in in, in many ways uh, appropriate going forward. You know, where do you target it? Maybe some neighborhoods are more important than others, but that's uh, the essence. I think what would come out as a result of this uh, uh, of this process. So, Vince, I think you make a good point on that I, I think there there may be locations where the neighborhood or uh, may want to shift back to that and, and others that may not is there a pilot location that might be looked at and see how it works and just a thought you mentioned just briefly in amongst us and we've talked about this uh, council for a while in the neighborhood enterprise zones and and that that jurisdiction we had actually an inquiry one day about what are the zones where are they can they be changed they, the person wanted to add pretty much the whole city so that's not permissible but you can adjust what we uh set forth and maybe there's a discussion with the housing strategy as well as another uh, i'll say opportunity to use that uh, the nez is uh, maybe we'll get the maps back out and provide them to council just to see where it's at because i know some council members may not have seen them for a while or, or not at all and then and maybe in discussion, I think, back why we picked that and what it was and what that means, because it just can't be placed anywhere. I think it's got to fit, fit a need, so that's an item. Do you see that uh, I, um, with the restructuring uh, where that, that role will fall within a person's, you know, outreach, communication, and hopefully implementation? I know we have not really had uh, that opportunity to, so far, but I think it, and it may not fit everybody's need, but I think if it's there and we might find that, Nonprofit. Uh, I know early on the one church wanted to do that as a uh, be kind of a the extension for that. And, and sometimes paper gets paperwork gets in the way. But I think we have staff with a person assigned to, from a, a group, and they can help the 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 homeowners with the application process there to get it to the city that we then carry the load forward of getting it submitted correctly and through the assessors. I think it's really a partnership. So there might be some opportunities there. I think that uh, that's really what uh, the intent of it is, is to, to lay it all out there. You know, even in my quick presentation, uh, obviously the uh, uh, you know, comprehensive plan is going to look at homelessness uh, and what strategies can be employed there, even though I know that in within the county there's a, a countywide plan associated with it. There's been, uh, you know, discussion with, um, you know, other housing uh, 
uh, more affordable for lower income families? Uh, how do you do a mix of that uh, uh, between market rate and, and so those are the type of th and more importantly, where, um, you know, some areas are going to be net necessarily more appropriate for walkability than others. And, and actually, there's some language in there that, uh, you know, talks about, well, transit, that's an important element mm -hmm. in certain neighborhoods as well. So, uh, but where I'm going with this is I'm drafting up some job descriptions and I'd like to get this thing rolling uh, so that I can concurrently be advertising for a position and also soliciting proposals for uh, this neighborhood uh, uh, residential strategy. Other questions from uh, Andrew? Um, I'm glad that we're moving forward with this. I know that I, as well as some of my colleagues, have talked about it going back to the goals and objectives session. It seems to be a very important thing that we want to get done this term. Um, we want to bring on more staff to help with this. Uh, that's creation of a new position. Is that it, my It's in the proposed budget. The neighborhood through, services. Yeah. 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 Well, it's it's you know we've had uh, you know it's uh, again a movement uh, from uh, Mr. Cochran's position into where Mr. Green was. Uh, and moving his position more or less into reallocating, uh, you know, toward this uh, deputy director neighborhood specialist position so that you've got high level professionals right at the top. Uh, and then we're actually, you know, we'd be moving uh, the DDA director position uh, that we have uh, into uh, as a planner position, which historically had been there. We obviously have uh, Caitlin, whatever her married name is now. and. Uh, <laughs> And so, and then the, the other position that was uh, created with this budget uh, deals um, uh, also along with the support from an economic development and grant writing uh, capacity as well. So it's all within the context of what was the adopted budget. Well, that, that's awesome. That's awesome. And then we think we're going to have to, we're doing another housing study in addition to this. That's, that's what I'm. Well, this is actually within the uh, citywide housing uh, study right yeah yeah that's that's just that is my understanding i just want to confirm that yeah okay we had, we had a housing study i think it was in 2017 if i'm not mistaken that was right when i i think it was issued before um this half a council came on board just that term um in what ways have we meaningfully implemented that that was more of a housing uh, market analysis not a comprehensive uh uh, housing uh, strategy. Uh, it tells you what's affordable, that type of thing. This goes into a lot more detail as to, you know, what uh, zoning uh, changes you may consider, what uh, uh, code requirements you may consider, how you would actually allocate some of your potential resources such as CDBG, whether, you know, we've got too much in the fix, not enough uh, programming uh, in that area. How much with uh, demolition and blight enforcement? So this is that this is a lot more than just a market analysis of what's affordable uh, based on your market. This is uh, looking at a lot more detail related to some of the challenges that we have with uh, uh, housing in general. Gotcha. Thank you for the information. Other questions or comments? Anything else, Mr. Pesto? If you're okay with it, I, I'm ready to, to get, get rolling on this so that the two of them are going to move forward concurrently. So it may be a few months down the road, but uh, then internally we'll, uh, you know, talk, come back with council about, uh, you know, how we're going to administer the uh, uh, review of the consultants that submit proposals and, and how we uh, go about uh, from there. So, okay. Very good. I have a follow-up when you talk about the structure, uh, the, uh, the reorganization, and the uh, items we've talked about here recently and had some action taken on blight and stuff. This fall falls in the same area. Is it part of this um, oversight? I know we have the building uh, department officials, but just trying to see if there's any, how that crossover might be. There may be, um, I would be shocked if there weren't recommendations related to uh, how to uh, make some either code or Mm -hmm. uh, resource uh, improvements related to blight and, and where the focus needs to be, you know, is our housing rental inspection sufficient? Should we, we do it more frequently, focus on 
other areas, uh, those type of things. You know, if you're doing a bigger apartment complex, it may not be as uh, time consuming per unit, uh, but there are others that may be a lot more uh, uh, involved with uh, and maybe require more frequent uh, uh, inspection. So that that's part of what comes out of it uh, based on the uh, uh, review and analysis of our uh, housing stock. And, and yeah. Very good, thanks. So the questions, anything further, Mr. Pastu? Just other items as uh, time permits, I can keep going if you okay. want I'll for another five any, minutes. Any questions from the uh, council members regarding uh, this or other items on the agenda, uh, Kelly? Yeah, it says, uh, somebody said something about alleys. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. I don't know when we stop maintaining the alleys, but I think we should go back to getting them back in good shape, especially considering the two-way changes we made. And um, so, yeah, I think the alleys would be a good, um, a great idea, bringing the alleys up out of disrepair. But even I think some of that, uh, if I may just follow up on it, how do you go about uh, paying for it? Uh, I mean, there's the physical aspect of it. Uh, you know, is it a combination of uh, property owner special assessment uh, or, you know, city providing some funding to a certain extent, whether it's 50% or whatever. It's just something that you have to, you know, we can start working toward if that's in fact one of the recommendations of, uh, of the, the study. Yeah, I think it's a good point. I think if, if we go down that path with uh, looking at the alleyways and maybe uh, starting with an area, you know, it's it, it. We're doing it for a purpose, and the purpose is we start to utilize that area for other functions that were used for in the past. And then, of course, then we get into the, the safety items of that. And uh, when the alleyway comes to the street, you know, it's got to be lit. You, you know, people are going to be pulling out or pulling in. So there's that's part of that whole analysis that'll have to be. I'm not sure it's going to start where every alley is going to be. You know, transform back to the old. Uh, or previous uses from you know years ago, but I think we could find a, a place that you know could be that pilot uh, program. Other question, uh, Brian? No, just a little input on that. Um, uh, I know that we have a refuse fund, and uh, in the past, that majority of the uh, refuse was put in the alleyway. I don't think that is currently the position of the city how we handle it now. Oh. So uh, I, I don't think you could use that as a uh, function to uh, fund taking care of the alleys, more or less. Not at this time. I think uh, if they were back in a condition and you didn't have any overhead lines to worry about, uh, you could maybe reconsider that uh, where folks would uh, take their uh, refuse uh, in their recycling containers to the alley, which would, I think would be ideal, but, uh, but uh, given their condition right now, it, impractical yeah I'm not sure if it's ideal for the refuse companies to go through the alleys anymore in its current form no <laughs> yeah. okay all right can I uh, take a little more time then since sure, we got a couple absolutely. minutes go ahead. Uh, we have about uh, 10 I'll say about five yeah. more minutes or so before we take a few minutes break uh, I, at the uh, regular meeting tonight I'm going to ask for City Council to consider uh, an amendment to the uh, agenda Actually, what I'd like to do is add uh, a closed session uh, when we uh, get to the end of our, you know, our last public comment. Uh, that would uh, one be uh, related to land acquisition, and the, the second one would be uh, labor negotiations. Uh, provide you an update on the, on one of the contracts we're negotiating. So. Um, The other thing while we're here is just uh, also uh, you're going to have some big projects coming forward. Uh, uh, at the uh, June uh, 20th meeting, you'll have uh, Lazy Boy Phase 2, I believe, uh, the bids coming in for that project. Some, and, and then uh, here shortly within the next week, you're going to have the St. Mary's Garden uh, project uh, out for bid. You know, that one's going to probably be in the neighborhood of $5 million. Uh, and we anticipate uh, that would be uh, before the uh, city council at the first meeting in July. So got a couple of big projects that are going to be underway, uh, and both of those will roll into completion in 2023. But we think the timing is good 
uh, particularly as some uh, contractors are completing uh, their early 2022 contracts. They can get started on these major projects and have the flexibility of finishing up in the following construction season. So, uh, so those will be coming to council here in the next uh, six weeks or so. So just to confirm, uh, confirm Mr. Pasto, on the agenda then, uh, you're looking for at the uh, 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 amendment to the agenda to add a uh, closed session at the end of the meeting following citizens comment. Uh, for land acquisition and labor negotiations, is that correct? Yep. Okay. Everything else. That's it. That's it. Okay. If there's no other comments from council. We have about uh, 13 minutes before the next uh, we start the regular meeting. So at this time, I'll close the work session and see everybody at 7:30. Thank you.